Hey, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Your Owners, your go-to place for urology healthcare information. Welcome to the show. We meet every Saturday at 9 a.m. Central Time, and you can watch us on any of those things. We go and broadcast to all of those. Um, welcome to the show. If this is your first time joining us, be sure to check out our website at euronurse.com, the best place to go to learn more about the show. Also, best place to see all of our past episodes, 108 of those now. So be sure to join us over there. Want to listen to us in your car? I know a lot of you do because I look at the statistics and it's real easy. Go to our Euro Nurse Plus area. You can get our audio podcast on any of your favorite podcasting formats. This week, we're going to be talking about cystoscopy and what's your office protocol. We did a, I sent a survey out to a lot of you and you've answered it, which I appreciate. We're going to go over some of those uh, answers. Let's go ahead and bring in our experts right now. Experts, welcome to the show. Hey, it worked, except for mine. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> You'll be the host. Who cares? Yeah, it doesn't really matter. Welcome to the show. John, you snuck in your, just at the last minute. I got you on. So. Sure did. Uh, so, hey, welcome, everybody. Labor Day weekend. I can't believe how fast the summer went by. Uh, I'm going to kick it off with my introduction, Vic Sinise. I'm the host and producer of the show. Been involved in urology for longer than I care to talk about, but it's, it does pay off because I have some extra knowledge sometimes. At least I have legacy knowledge. Uh, go ahead, Lori, go, give your introduction. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lori Atkinson. Happy Labor Day weekend. I know we all probably need it and deserve it. So happy Labor, Labor Day weekend. Um, I'm a certified urology registered nurse. I've been in urology since 1998. That is a long time. And I currently work for Northwestern Medicine in Geneva and Winfield, Illinois. Well, welcome. And Jan, go ahead. Good morning. I am passionate about helping urology practices reach maximum clinical and financial efficiency. To that end, I created the Thriving Urology Practice Facebook group. It is a free Facebook group where we crowdsource practice management solutions for your benefit. And I like to think of myself as a modern day Robin Hood. You see, I take from the information rich and give it to the time constrained poor people like you. I frequently speak on the topics of coding, billing, revenue cycle management, marketing, and how to run your practices more efficiently in the era of declining reimbursement and rising overhead costs. If you'll be at the South Central section of the AUA meeting in October, I'll see you there. Uh, otherwise, I will see you at the Urology Advanced Coding and Reimbursement Seminar in December in Las Vegas. I am John Lynn, a private practice urologist in Gilbert, Arizona, and I look forward to our discussion today about cystoscopies. Back to you. Vic. All right. Thanks, John. I'm going to switch this over to our format. Now we're going to do it a little bit different. So normally you see just me talking or whoever the guest speaker is talking, but I've got all my experts on because we're going to discuss a lot of this. So uh, today our topic is cystoscopy. What's your office protocol? And those of you that are watching the show, Lori, will be watching that comment box. Send your comments, questions, thoughts. What are you guys doing? I'd like to learn more. Um, those of you that filled out this survey that I sent, I appreciate that. That was uh, really, I'll give you the history behind why I did this. So the reason I did the survey was I'm going to be speaking for the uh, SUNA group in September. The end of September is our big annual meeting. Come join us out in Orlando. It's going to be at the SeaWorld. Uh, first time I think it's I've seen a, a an actual conference at the SeaWorld. So anyway, I'm going to be speaking not once, but twice. I'm trying to catch up to John a little bit. He's always got a lot of speaking engagements. And one of them they asked me to talk about was setting up for vasectomy and for cystoscopy. Um, obviously aimed at people that are new to urology. And I started thinking, you know, I know how we do it. I know what some of the research has shown because I've been part of the AUA SUNA white paper group that did the white papers on prostate biopsy, reprocessing, and on cystoscopy. So I, I know a thing or two because I've been involved in things, but what's really going on out there? And I wanted more information. I think it'll make the talk better if I can kind of understand what I 
what I believe and then what's really happening out in the real world. So, and we're going to open this up to my experts who are on the panel. Anytime you guys have a thought or something during the survey, feel free to throw it in there. But I started off with a very simple survey, just asking what type of cystoscopy you're doing in your office. Um, again, this I, you could have the choice in some of these questions to answer both. That's why you'll see 150% for the answers. But I think it's not probably a big surprise to anybody that flexible cystoscopy is probably the, the leading thing that we see done and some rigid in the office. Um, anybody in the experts got an opinion on that? Seemed pretty reasonable. Nothing surprising. No, no I think uh, rigid cystoscopy, sometimes people use it for their Botox injections. Some people use, well, I when I perform lifts in the office, I, I obviously use a, a rigid scope. So, so we're still seeing some of it. I was around when the first flexible scope was introduced and I can't even think of how many years ago it was, but we had a urologist who, who loved to always be on the cutting edge and he got the scope, but he hardly used it. He, it was all the young guys that came up after that really utilized it. Of course, now it's probably the standard of care in the office. Thank, thankfully. All right. So then I asked who's performing cystoscopy in the office. No surprise, mostly, uh, MDs. Um, Sorry about your DOs, I didn't specify. So physician done, but also a number of PAs and nurse practitioners, and this is fairly new, um, that the NPs or the advanced practice nurses are and PAs are getting involved in cystoscopy. Um, any thoughts on that? Lori, have you seen any of that in your office? I do. So, so yeah, our providers do mainly the, the diagnostic systems. Um, our PAs, we have some PAs that actually do the cysto stent removals. They'll do a lot of those. And John, from a urologist standpoint, what do you think about that? Well, I think a lot of the uh, urologists are worried about encroachment by the uh, PAs and NPs in doing the things that we usually do. But I think stent removal is pretty straightforward. Make, as long as you could get into the bladder, you find the foreign body, you use a grafter to remove it, not a big deal. But uh, diagnostic cystoscopies, it does take a little bit of more training and experience in knowing what you're looking at. So yeah. I, that um, I think in that case, the use is, I think, is right on. Uh, but I know practices that are allowing the APPs to perform diagnostic cystoscopies, pretty much the whole suite of cystoscopies. And I think as long as, you know, they're properly trained and somebody is, you know, there to kind of double check their work as they're learning, it's, it's something that obviously there's no magic wand that they, you know, utilize in, in medical school to make you guys better than the, they do anywhere else. So, And nowadays and, you can record the video if you yeah. want to double check on the work of the APPs. Yeah. In the old days, we had this, in order to, to share a scope, it had this, this other lens that attached to it. So you could look, I used to do that with one of our urologists. The problem is it really cut the, the volume of light coming through it quite a bit. So it really wasn't a, as good. Now with video, I mean, it's perfect. So, all right, let's get on to our next question. Thanks, Fran, for your information there. So who sets up the equipment in your office? Um, so probably no big surprise, except that I can't spell the word assistant. Um, but that most of these are being set up by the medical assistants, uh, nurses. My big surprise was there's actually an MD who's setting up his own equipment. Kudos to that doc who's doing their own. The other group I probably should have allowed to find out who those are, but my, my guess, and maybe you guys can put it in the comments if you have a actual information is, is these are people that are just trained that are non-nurses, non-medical assistants, they haven't gone through any formal education in the medical field, but they worked, you know, for a doctor's office and were trained. Anybody's thoughts on that? Yeah, ours is mainly our medical assistants. You know, the nurses will help out when needed, but then we do have clinical assists, um, like you said, who, who they're not certified medical assistants, but we've trained them to do that. Yeah. So we have some of those as well. Good. And, and I got to say, there's, go ahead. There's no, no judgment here. I'm not trying to say what's right or wrong. I'm just trying to find out what's being done. And I really made the survey. One thing I said is it's anonymous. There's no, I don't track any emails. I don't know who sent the information. And I really think I got some true, honest answers, which is helpful. Go ahead, John. 
Well, I like to remind people that the physician is the, and then APPs are the most expensive employees in the practice. So when we say that you should be operating at the top of your license, I always think, can somebody else do the tasks that I'm doing? And if the answer is yes, then I should not be doing it. I should be doing things that are more productive in the practice. I agree. And and that's and that's why I really think that's the perfect uh, example where medical assistants are the right person to be doing that. You know, if you're putting your registered nurse taking their time at their hourly salary to to reprocess equipment, that's probably wasted money. All right, good. Oh, and we've got some comments on that, Vic. Oh, good. Go ahead. Let's bring that back. I'll so bring that slide Regine, back up. Regis says they do they have a surgical assistant. Okay, so that would be probably that other class, great. Um, you use mainly LVNs. We do have scrub tech for cysto cleaning purposes. That's from good Nisha. News. Good, good, good information. Thanks. Nisha. Oh, she meant text. I, I kind of thought that <laughs> she meant the text. Good. All right. Well, thanks. That was some interesting information. And, and I think in this, in the, uh, the subtext is in performing cystoscopies is that depending on where you practice, your ability to do certain things may be limited. And also depending on the state in which you practice. In, it's going to vary, you're right. Yeah. California, I think, may be a little bit more restrictive on who can do what. Yeah, absolutely. It's been a long time since I did the research, but when we started adding medical assistance, I researched for you know practice acts. The only state I could find a practice act for medical assistance is California. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because at the SUNA conference, I'm actually um, going to be speaking. We're doing a position paper on MA for I'm on an MA task task force, and we're mm -hmm. actually talking about the fact that a lot of medical assistants, even though they're allowed to do these things, there's nothing to back it up. Um, there's no you know protocols or or, or team training devices, things like that. So we're working on that. So if you go to the SUNA con con uh, conference, yeah. you'll learn more. That's right. All right. So the other one I asked was um, the setup that you use in your office. And I, this one, I was hunting for some conversation. Uh, sterile field, sterile gloves, total sterile setup versus non-sterile setup like a chuck pad and non-sterile gloves, procedural gloves. And we can see from the statistics that the bulk are using a sterile field, sterile gloves, but there's a small percentage. Well, that may be all that small, almost 10% that are using... Um, you know, something besides a sterile field. Now, being on the white paper for this discussion with, um, you know, physicians, urologists, and nurses together kind of arguing this thing out, I have to say there is one point that was made during the, the talk um, when I was doing the ultrasound white paper is this part of the instrument really is not necessarily have to be sterile because they said, where do you, where do you draw the line at sterile? You know, how far do you have to be gowned up and everything to do a cystoscopy or prostate biopsy? Because the part that goes in the patient is the, you know, the, the catheter side of it, not the, the handle uh, per se. And I'll bring up my experts to kind of get your feeling on that one. What, what do you think about uh, the setup? Does it have to be completely sterile or just keeping the tip sterile or the catheter side of it sterile? Lori? No. So, I mean, if you think about it, most most places um, clean their scopes with a high level disinfection. It's not sterile. Um, right. The procedure itself is not considered sterile, and that's AUA guidelines as well. So we um, we do a high level disinfection, but as far as our procedure is concerned, we do not do not do it sterilely. So we have the chucks and the and the regular gloves. Good, good. And, and, and again, I can see the argument. John, what's your thoughts? Yeah, I'm with Lori on this one. You do not need to ma make it a sterile type procedure. And very importantly, we worry about infection risk. And I will tell you, the infection risk is extremely low, even when you don't use a sterile type of set setup. So yeah. I think a lot of practices are wasting a lot of money and resources when they are setting up this entire sterile field. And yeah. and, and the, whoever's handling the instrument is is having to use whatever precautions necessary. I think that is overkill. Yeah, I, I and I agree, and that's what we came to as a conclusion in our guidelines for prostate. That you know, there's there's a certain point of it. You know, you don't need to have a sterile glove on to use the ultrasound probe. 
that part that's you're holding is not going into a patient. So, you know, it's, it's all, all kind of using good common sense, which we know doesn't exist too much anymore, but wait, 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 that, let's, let's think about the transract ultrasound, go to go on a tangent a little bit. Okay. Into which orifice are you inserting that ultrasound pro? Hmm. <laughs> that, that nice, that non-contaminated rectum, right? <laughs> Whatever. That's yeah. Good, good, good point. I, I can't, <clears throat> in the comments, if you guys want to also make a comment about how you like this format, I really thought of this as just, I think it's fun to kind of be able to go back and forth with people and get opinions. But anyway, going on. So now I did ask a question about what size sterile bag do you use for cystoscopy? And there's really three out there that you can use, 100 cc, 1,000 cc, and 3,000 cc. And those are the ones that, <clears throat> excuse me, for sterile water that we order. And I was glad to see that nobody's using the 3000. I put that in for a reason and I'll get to that in my next question. Um, as far as the, the thousand versus the hundred though, if, if as a cost basis, they're pretty much the same cost. So most people do use a thousand. We use a thousand for that reason, because sometimes I can get a thousand CC bag for less than a hundred because there's just larger numbers of those sold. So I don't know if anybody using anything different or heard anything different in your practices than uh, well, I know but, that we actually use two fifties. Um, I mean, I we'll never use saw the, that. Yeah. We used to use a thousand, you know, and maybe we still do on certain types of procedures, knowing that you're going to use a lot more water, but, yeah. but there's no reason to use thousands. That's just kind of a waste. It, it is a waste except financially. Because yeah. I, a lot of times I can buy thousand CC bags for less than the hundreds. Yeah. So, and Susie, uh, yeah, Susie said they use 500. Oh, huh. so live and learn. Oh, and See, Rajesh says more. 500 as well. Nice in the middle. Now, the reason I asked the question was this one. Do you reuse the same water for multiple patients? Thankfully, most said no. Some said yes. Now, that one I do have some research on. So before I turn it over to my experts, I will say what I could find. And there was an article that appeared in the British Journal of Urology that said, do not reuse your, your cysto irrigating equipment. <clears throat> Excuse me, boy, allergy season. Um, and what they're looking for is, does the system reflux? So they did a, they put a sensor in there that could detect if anything was coming back up retrograde. Interestingly, in their results, they, they found that um, there was reflux and irrigating fluid in 11 male patients and was significant in six uh, of the 65 patients they tested, but there was no reflux found in the female studies. Their conclusion, though, still said infection control measures must include the prevention of transmission of bloodborne infections, especially hepatitis. It takes very little blood to, to cause uh, hepatitis transfer. Um, so from their evidence, flexible cystoscopy should always be performed with single-use irrigation systems. So, hmm, what's everybody's thoughts on that one? Well, Vic, like you and I have been in urology a long time, and I remember when we used to reuse the water. I mean, we would do it after cysto until they figured out, and it makes total sense because as you're doing cysto, sometimes you'll see them reflux, and you'll see that urine go right up back up that tube. So it makes 100% sense. So uh, yeah, we don't ever reuse. Yeah. It's, it's, there's no anti-reflux valve built into it. I, I'm with you. I, when I joined the practice, I was the first nurse they brought in and I'm sitting through a cystoscopy. I'm like, how is this not, how is this safe to do, use the same bag? They go, well, you know, it doesn't reflux. And the patient I happened to be in was a bloody case who had a bladder spasm. And I said, it doesn't. And as you can see, the red going up the tube. Bing, won, won that argument. We, it's what we switched over to the, the single use. And John, I see you shaking your head. So I'm glad to see that our urologist in the practice is agreeing with us. So let's stop that now. You folks out there, go to your people in charge and tell them, no, there is some, show them the research article. <laughs> so, all right. The next question, uh, this one I just threw out there, just kind of interested. Do you use lidocaine jelly for male patients? And the also the con converse size, do you use it for female patients? And most are getting, you know, most of the men are getting some lidocaine. Half of the women are, half aren't. Um, not sure 
why uh, you know the males would need more or, or get more or less. Um, I know this is a controversial uh, subject. I've argued this one with uh, a good friend of mine, uh, and and her opinion is, you know, it doesn't. There's no good science to support the use of lidocaine. However, I don't care about good science. I'll give you some bad science. I get my have to go to get my teeth clean, and I've had a hygienist do it without the topical. That's like a nine. I had the topical three. So I'm, I'm all for it, even though I've never had cystoscopy, so I can't comment. <laughs> John, what are your thoughts? Well, I'll tell you, I'll give you the answer as to why men need uh, lidocaine, because we're big sissies. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Most men are overly anxious, and we, we never had menstrual cycles. We never had cramping and bleeding. We, we're not used to seeing doctors. So anytime a guy comes in for a cystoscopy, vasectomy, we're like, oh, uh, no, don't do not do anything to me. Yep. And that's why I think the placebo effect of viscous lidocaine is extremely strong. That said, yeah. I think if the urologist or whoever whomever is performing the cystoscopy is good enough, viscous lidocaine is not necessary, irrespective I, I, of I, gender. I think that's I think that's a good, valid point. Uh, a placebo effect, don't don't underestimate it. It makes a huge difference, especially if you can sell it. Oh, don't worry. We're going to give you a local. Oh, okay. You know, as long as, you, as long as they know they're getting it, then they're a lot better off. Lori, what are your thoughts? Well, I wanted to bring up um, a comment before I say what I'm going to say. So Susie said 10 years ago, we never used Lido gel on females, but we do 100% of the time now. Um, so we used to use uh, Lido, uh, Glido, whatever you want to use on um, yeah. males and females. We don't do it on females. We do do it on me, uh, males, not only for the placebo effect, but I think because of the lubrication. So I think that it's just, yeah. I think that the scope would go in easier. But now let's be realistic. The lidocaine probably doesn't get up to the part where men are going to go, ow. I mean, you're not going to get away from that. Um, so, but yeah, it's definitely more of a placebo effect. And with females, they, you know, as long as you don't tell them that, you know, you have the option or, um, you know, it's just a little pinch for them. Why put it in and then give them another little pinch? There's no point. So, yeah. And if you're going to use lidocaine, the only thing that's going to make it work is if you wait, the mm -hmm. dwell yes. time is what's important. So if you're going to use it, like for instance, the, the physician or APP inserts a viscous lidocaine and immediately goes to cystoscopy, that's a total waste. <laughs> yeah, that's, and that's, that's a valid point, which actually brings me up to my next uh, comment wait, wait. here. If Go the ahead. person is really that anxious about cystoscopies, then consider using nitrous oxide. Yep, Pronax. <laughs> it mellows them all out. Or Nitronox Plus. Yeah. Uh, so then I asked the question, if you use lidocaine jelly, who's administering it? <clears throat> and not uh, by any su big surprise, it was, and again, it could be more than one answer could be correct. Um, so nurses are by far the ones administering it, followed by medical assistants, physicians, um, and and a NPs and PAs also, plus the other who we don't, we're thinking are probably techs. Um Probably not a big surprise that uh, you know NB, NDs, PAs, and MPs are doing it, but I think as John had said in his comment that it's probably given, and then they go ahead and scope. I don't think they're waiting. The advantage of having somebody else give it is normally, like in our practice, we go in, we give the lido, we put a clamp on, and walk out and let the patient dwell, and then the physician, by the time they get in there, that that stuff has done its job. Makes and it does make a difference. You can tell if somebody's had it in there for a while versus someone who just gives and goes. And to anyone who actually is listening and doing cystoscopies, the key is to when you for the males at least, when you get to the external sphincter, just wait, wait a few seconds there, talk to the patient, get him to relax a little bit. I tell the patients to relax your buttock area, relax your back, relax your legs, and then the external sphincter will open up. He'll relax, and then the scope just goes right in. That's the yeah. key area, I think. Yeah. So I I had a a, go, go ahead. 
Sorry. So Nisha said they're using lidocaine for both. And then Tavo says, I believe lidocaine helps based on patient responses. I inserted in our patients and we wait at least 10 minutes. Ah, good, good practice. Hey, and thanks for you guys chirping in there. I know we have a pretty good crowd here watching the show. So I appreciate all these comments coming in. Uh, a, a word back to what John had said. So I got called in. Uh, one of my responsibilities when I was rounding in the hospital was to put catheters in when they couldn't get a catheter in somebody. So I went in to put a catheter in a, a patient and the guy said, you know, listen, three people have tried this. I've had enough of it. And as John said, one of the problems with anxiety is they tighten up and they can tighten that sphincter up. And what people were doing is they're trying to push against this guy who was fighting them. So I kind of learned how I could rest my uh, on the hand that wasn't sterile kind of against the inner thigh where you can feel that muscle in their leg. Yeah. And I would tell them now relax, relax. And even though you're telling them, they don't always relax. As soon as I felt that muscle relax, I pushed the catheter and it went right in. So I told him, I said, I'd get this in in one shot or I'd call it quits. And of course, then he, every time he saw me, he said, Hey, one shot. <laughs> So it's, it's it, true. It the same, as you yeah, said. The same thing when you're trying to put in a catheter, if you're trying to perform a cystoscopy or if you're trying to perform a vasectomy. Now in the last three years, I've performed about 3,300 vasectomies. I have a little bit counting? of experience. What was that? But who's counting? Yeah. <laughs> it's with, and, and also with no advertising uh, with, so I have a little bit of experience in doing this procedure. And what you said, Vic is exactly true. I, you know, one of my hands or both of my arms are, are resting gently on the patient. And yeah. you can feel when the calves are tightened. And I don't tell the patients to relax. I tell the patients, you, you feel how tense you are down in the pelvic area, down in your legs. I want you to do the opposite of that. A lot of people don't, don't quite get relaxed. Okay, relax, yeah. relax. Do the opposite of what you're doing right now. See how tense you are. Feel how tense you are. That there's a little trick for you. Yeah. Yeah. See, look where you're going to get tips like this, right? From the experts. So yeah, no, it's true. And, and, and John, you, you don't have to advertise when you got word of mouth, that's all you need, right? Good results are going to bring in plenty of customers. So I think good that's, product uh, is key. A, a lot of people say, how do I do more of this, more of that? I, yes. I tell that you have to start with a good product and the Absolutely. mindset of continuing process improvement or Japanese phrase called Kaizen is imperative in no matter yeah. irrespective of what you do in the office you have to think about how do i do this better the next time and that's how i'm able to do vasectomies in under five minutes consistently yeah yeah that that, that would make a big difference for who i picked that's for sure all and right it's, it's interesting sometimes the patient will say why am i paying you so much money to do a vasectomy i tell him that you're not paying me this money to do the five minute procedure you're paying me all this money for the 30 years of schooling and experience to get to where I am. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Uh, people don't always like to think about that. It's the me, me, me generation. All right. Now getting to the meat of what we're looking at, because this is a lot of what I'm going to talk about is who reprocesses cystoscopy equipment after your use in the office. And again, that probably not a big surprise. Medical assistants and others are the primary person doing it. As we kind of spoke to it, that's probably who should be doing it. Still some nurses out there being, uh, are doing it, nurse practitioner. Um, I'm guessing it must be a real solo practice uh, um, because as we said, it's not the best use of money in today's economy. That does matter. Uh, not a big surprise, MDs, PAs showed none, but of course, small sample size will also have some of that effect. Um, but I wanted to see who's doing it because my next question was, who trains the employees on reprocessing equipment? And so I gave what I thought were the most logical choices, a supervisor, the person in charge, um, fellow employee, uh, the company, some of the companies I know do offer training on their scopes and what they tell you to disinfect it. And then I threw in that no training offered. And that's the one that's to me is a little scary. Um, not surprised fellow employees training other employees makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, the, the cystoscope companies having somebody who can, can talk about it, but the no training part, that to me just seems crazy. Lori, you have, have something set up for new employees for reprocessing? Yeah. So I'm actually a supervisor, so I can tell you that I can show somebody, but, but in my opinion, the best person to show is somebody who's been doing it a lot. 
And so, because I'll go in there and, you know, I haven't done them in weeks because I've got other people doing them. It mm -hmm. just makes sense. Um, but I do, however, make sure they're doing it correctly. And we do have, an, you know, a protocol and information and, and make sure everybody's doing it the right way. Yeah. And John, do you have a protocol in your office for who trains? No, we just grab whoever's off the street and we say, go. Oh, clean so you're there 10%. <laughs> No, actually, I ha we have a combination. So we have supervising person who can oversee. We have a fellow MA to train the new MA on how to process the endoscope. And we recently had Olympus come out because we use Olympus scopes. And they their, their reps also trained us. In addition, we have a guide posted where we perform reprocessing. And it's, yep. it's a flexible endoscope cleaning and disinfection guide. So we we don't rely on memory. We don't rely on dogma. We follow the protocol. Yeah. And and we we all know that all of us here on the panel know, and certainly probably most of the audience, the danger of not reprocessing these things properly. If they're not reprocessed properly, patients can be, become infected. And that's not a good thing. Um, even not cleaning and, and getting the disinfectant off of them, there's been some cases of cystitis from the chemical burn, you know, chemical cystitis from the not processed. And yes, Rajesh, the disposable I see that. Stove, scopes, yeah, they use for disposable, which, which we actually um, tried a few weeks ago, uh, only because one of our um, we have we were lucky to have this this uh, machine called a Metavator to do our high level disinfect for our stucopes. The problem is, is those machines break down. And so mm. to have on hand, we have the disposable scopes, but they're expensive. They're very expensive. And they're going I, I to be unaffordable next year unless something changes with the physician fee schedule that is proposed by CMS. Yeah. And they always try to claim that if you look at the cost of your high level disinfection and the employee to do it and all that, you add it up. But I, I don't know. It just seems like it's it's a nice idea, but I don't think it's uh, it's it's workable. There was a company that used to make a sheath that you could put a scope into that was sterile, and the cost of the sheath though was so expensive that it just persists. Though, as you say, with reimbursement dropping, doesn't add up. Um, I do want to talk l briefly about reprocessing medical equipment. So I'm going to bring up full slides here for a second. Um, you know, this is nothing new. Forty years ago, Earl Spalding came up with this classification scheme broken into three categories, critical items, which are the things like surgical equipment. They're considered number one, they should be, you know, recommended sterilization unless they're heat sensitive. So that's anything that enters sterile tissue or the vascular system. Semi-critical items, which is what cystoscopy falls into, come in contact with mucous membranes or non-intact skin. Uh, require high level disinfection with a, li uh, a liquid disinfectant. Uh, there are no um, flexible scopes I'm aware of that you can heat sterilize, but there are cystoscopes that are autoclave safe. We have some of those in our office and we autoclave those. Um, Non-critical items like your stethoscope and blood pressure cup are, cons are considered low level and they can, or non-critical items and they can use low level disinfectants. We use these PDF, uh, PDI Sani wipes and if you look, they kill just about everything. So, I mean, still a good disinfectant, but you don't need to have that high level that you do with the other equipment. So at that, I brought in the question of which disinfectant do you actually use? And no big surprise, glutaraldehyde was the kind of the number one in the chain. Um, some of these other ones like the ortho, the OPAs, the Steris system, which I've never used, but I know that's a, a complete reprocessing. Metavator, Laura, you said you mentioned you have that one. So I, mm -hmm. I, I haven't seen it, so it's a low percentage. Um, some of these comments, I did allow comments, so I, I was reading through, and some people are sending them out to a company to have them reprocessed in between. So there's some off-site reprocessing of the equipment being done. Um, I think most people are reprocessing their scopes in their office. Um, John, do you reprocess in your office or do you send them out? Oh, yeah. I think the most efficient way is to reprocess it in the office. Yeah. yeah. I think unless you're like connected with a hospital and using their systems and they're taking care of it through their central sterilization system. Well, well then, then if inefficiency is built in, so that's... Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. 
All right. So good. Um, Gluteraldehyde, we know, is the number one because it's been around for the, forever since the 60s. The one thing I did want to mention, I think it's it's important, is the uh, OSHA does, you know, OSHA is the one that protects us, the user of this stuff, against getting injured. And OSHA is a product that requires some um, care with the use of it. The most serious side effect is is the vapor. You can, you know, inhale it and it has some bad side effects from that. You can get uh, on your skin dermatitis. Your eyes can be irritated. Your nose can be irritated. Um, there are recommended exposure controls, mostly to make sure that you're having this level of, of glutaraldehyde in the room. Those of us that have worked it with it, you know how it smells. It's not very pleasant. Um, and if you build up high concentrations, that can actually be dangerous. So I asked the question, do you have a ventilation system or fume hood specifically designed for safe handling of high level disinfection products in your office? And it was almost a 50-50 mix that do and don't. Um, we do, I can tell you that because it, it does build up. Back when I started, there was a product called Sporocidin, I believe. It smelled like uh, mouthwash. It was very pleasant and we didn't have anything in there, um, but it got pulled because it wasn't strong enough. Then we switched to glutaraldehyde and I'm like, whoa, this stuff is really strong. We had a small room that we did it in. So we weren't certainly didn't have enough air volume. Um, so we switched over to one of these fume hoods. It's amazing. You don't smell it at all if you got one running. Lori, what do you guys, what you guys are sending out, right? Well, since we, well, we have the Metivator. So, you know, it's in the office. We, it's a chemical called Rapicide. Um, We don't necessarily have to have a hood for that. You know, it's all in this machine. Although I want to stress how important it is when you're dealing with these chemicals, you should be wearing a gown, goggles, you should be wearing gloves that, you know, cover uh, because these things are potent and don't take them. Yeah. Um, don't take it, you know, don't take them for granted because we have had, you know, some accidents with these and it's not, it's no joke. Yeah. And that's where training comes in. Mm -hmm. And John, what do you guys use in your office? We have a dedicated fan in each one of the uh, rooms. So the fan is constantly running whenever, whenever the day exchange. starts, the fan is running. Yep. So the, again, I, the room oh, we yeah, had was a small room with no ventilation. Yeah. So, I, so it's sucking out the air. You need to have something. And I'm going to probably just bring up my next slide here. There are systems that you can purchase for your office that can detect how much glutaraldehyde exposure you're having. And you, it's not very expensive. Somebody can wear a monitor, send it in and make sure that your air exchange is, is there. Do you have to have a hood? No, it, the hoods work. I'm just telling you that they're they're very effective. I've done it with the the hood, and it's like doesn't even show up anything. Um, but uh, keep your levels within the normal. As uh, as Lori had mentioned, gloves, safety eyewear, gowns, lab coats. Those things should be worn because you don't want to get this stuff accidentally on your yourself. You know, the worst you could do is spill it on your scrubs, and you got nothing else to put on, right? Um. Poor practice can lead to exposure. And the next question I asked was, do you have a spill kit if you're using glutaraldehyde to design for high level disinfection products in case you spill? Now, I was really surprised by this one in that most do have the spill kit because uh, we, you know, it's, it doesn't happen very often, but boy, if it ever happens, you have a spill in your office, that stuff you have a lot of surface area to kind of get out and spread the fumes. This, the spill kit, you just throw this, it neutralizes it and it just disappears. Plus he has all the equipment you need to kind of soak it up. Um, again, Lori, I don't know if the Metavator, if there's some kind of spill kit for that or no, not. No, but one thing I can comment on that is make sure you have your MSDS, the safety sheets available, yes. because when that happens, you need to have that nearby to know exactly what to do. Yeah. John, you, you have a spill kit or you're ready out to get one? <laughs> no, we, we process everything in the in the same room. So the any sort of minor spill is easily contained. Yeah. No, and this I think is looking at a catastrophic. Somebody drops a tray of Sidex, for instance. That would be where you need a spill kit. The, the couple of drops as you're dumping it probably doesn't need a, it doesn't require a spill kit. So Oh, this is but, interesting. So Fran, I, I want her to um elaborate on this a while back we needed to wear a monitoring badge 
I, I'll bet you that's the one I was pointing out, that glutaraldehyde badge. Oh. Because, yeah, I mean, it's, it's like I said, it's fairly inexpensive. And I think it's, it's nice to have that documentation because if somebody says, hey, you know, I developed this because of my exposure, you say, well, wait a second, you know, we have safe, we're within safe levels. So sometimes you're just, you know, covering your, your butt. And keep in um, mind, so speaking of covering, whatever the scope is soaking, there's a lid over the tray. So you should yes. always have that on. Yes, that's a, that's a good point because I have seen where people don't cover it and it's open and that stuff, yeah. you're, you're spilling it into the air. So definitely should be covered to minimize the amount. And I think it's it's simple enough if you do these things to keep it within good levels. Um, and I said about large spills should be contained. And there's a product out there, and I was curious if people use it called Glued Out. And mostly it's used for when you're getting rid of your old glutaraldehyde. And it just, uh, when you're pouring it, there's a little higher level that you could get. The Glued Out will take it and make it neutral so you don't even smell it. Um, most people don't use it. Some do. So I think it was kind of a three quarters uh, were not using it. I don't know of any requirement that you have to do this, by the way. And there's no nothing I could ever find that said you can't dump it down a municipal sewer line. So I don't know any thoughts that you guys have on disposal. I have a, a, a thought, I, you know, a comment on that is that make sure that when you're dumping these chemicals, that you're watching what other chemicals you dump down that same sink because there can yeah. be reactions that Reaction. occur. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. All right. So that's what glued out looks like in case you haven't uh, seen it before. It just, you just dump it in there. It turns it to something that doesn't even smell. And you want to, of course, be careful when you're dumping it, that you're not splashing it and you're minimizing any uh, contact with it. Um, our particular system, that hood has a pump built into it. You just stick the tubing into it and it sucks out the stuff and puts it right down the drain. So next thing I asked is this question, how often do you test your high level disinfection with a test strip? And got a variety of answers, daily, weekly, don't use. Kind of surprised on the don't use part, but uh, um, again, the study isn't exactly uh, perfect. So I don't know if don't use means that they're dumping their solutions every day or, or what they're doing to not be using a test strip, but it is recommended that it's tested because even though on the bottle it says 28 days or whatever the length of it is, it'll tell you that, you know, with repeated use, if you're doing a lot of cystoscopies, it'll lose its effectiveness from being diluted from the scopes being put in and out of it. Yeah. Even with the Metavator, um, we have to test strip with each scope that we run. So every time we do a scope, we it's not just daily, it's every scope. Every scope, wow. Mm -hmm. And John, any thoughts? No, I'm going to have to claim ignorance on that. I don't know how frequently that is tested. Yeah. I think we are dumping the the flu solution out every single week because we do so many cystoscopies, even though it is good for, I don't know how many days, 14 days or 28 days. They're we're, 14 or 28, yeah. Yeah, we're changing that out very frequently. Because yeah. we're doing cystoscopies pretty much every single day. Yeah. So I, it's something to look at, something to think about, because it may be worth even on a weekly, if you're using solutions for once a week, run a test strip, at least know that your, your chemicals are good. And then I think once you realize what your process is, is working, that's something you can rely on. It always helps to have a, a something like that uh, cover. I'll talk about some, how you can cover your, yourself by, uh, in a little bit here. So the other thing I asked was how long do you soak your scopes for in your high level disinfection? And I went from one minute up to an hour and you can kind of see there that the bulk of us are doing the 20 minute soak. Some are doing 10 minutes, some are doing the one hour soak. And this is really kind of just a loaded question because it really doesn't depend on what I, th what I think you should do or what you think you should do. It's really what the chemical says on the bottle because they all have different soak times and um, that's I, exactly right. You have to read the bottle. And the only reason I brought this question up was I had an incident where the, uh, we've had some changeover in, in the, in the people that are in our, our practice now that are involved in this. And we ran out of the solution we needed to soak that we normally soak our scopes with. 
And we use this new stuff called Eldahol, which is alcohol and Sidex mix, glueraldehyde mix. And it's only has a 10 minute soak time. So it's a lot quicker. But they brought something else over. And I asked the girl who brought it over from this other office, how long do I need to soak it? Now, I knew that this was a loaded question. I wanted to just to assess her because that, as a supervisor, that's what I would do. And she said, oh, 10 minutes. I go, really? I says, where do you get that from? She says, well, they're all 10 minutes. I, I, I said, read the bottle, please. So, of course, I read the bottle. This bottle, I think it was a 60-minute amount to cause it to have high-level disinfection. So, whatever you do, read the bottle. It doesn't matter what we put in a survey or what we say. It depends on what solution you're using because they're all different. And you also shouldn't soak them for longer than what it says because it could yeah. cause damage to the scope. Yes. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's the quickest exactly way to, to ruin scopes. Yep, exactly. They fog up the lenses. We had that happen too. So yeah, everybody, you know, if a little bit's good, a lot's got to be great, right? That that mentality. So, or you get work? busy, you know, you walk away from a soaking scope and you get busy with something else and then yeah. you know, have egg timers as simple as I that. Say, that's what we do is we set timers. Yeah. Yeah. Just for that reason. Yeah. All we right, have, good. yeah, we have a timer that is going off that, and, and, uh, that's how the MAs can hear throughout the back of the office and they'll remember to remove the scope. All right. So I just want to make a point, you know, after you use a scope, it should be cleaned immediately to get most of the contaminants off. There then is a more thorough cleaning before it gets sterilized or disinfected. Uh, there's a product called, uh, enzymatic cleaner that's out there that I, we use it. I, I, it's a product that will break down proteins. So it's really good for getting blood, which is on most of the scopes and stuff off. Um, but it just gets a cleaner scope. Uh, do you guys use it, enzymatic cleaning or? And I Lord, love you know, that stuff. Yeah. We have, so we're kind of high tech where we're at. We're lucky because when we moved in, we were brand new to urology. So we kind of got what we wanted a little bit. So that's why we have this metavator and things like that. But we actually have something, it's called a scope buddy. And it's, it's intercept that actually pre-cleans you connect, they've got connectors to the scope wow. and it, it cleans and, you know, it goes through a cycle and runs things for 60 seconds through that, through that before we even put it in the metavator. So we're lucky we have a pretty. Uh, hey, Lori, I, you have to connect me with the rep for that company. I'd, I'd really like to have. Oh, absolutely. Come on and do a yeah. show for me because I'm interested absolutely. in I would. some of these more you know, automated system. I'll tell you another quick story about the enzyme solution. So of course, being the fact that I was on a white paper in urology, my name was on it. I got called as a consultant for a company that was doing uh, uh, procedures and they had a high infection rate. And they said, you know, would you mind coming in just ch checking over what we're doing? We don't understand why we're having patients, you know, higher than the norm developing infections. So I looked at their whole process, saw who, who was doing the procedure, how they were doing it, and they were using the enzyme as a sterilizing solution. They thought it was something that would kill off bacteria. And I said, enzyme does nothing for bacteria. All it does is get dirt off your, your instrument. So um, sometimes it's, uh, it's scary what you can find out there. But uh, yeah, good stuff to clean. Um, hey, Vic. So we've yeah. got some questions. I think this is great that 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 Tabo and Susie kind of brought this up. Um, so Tabo, I'm cur curious to know, how do you clean the patients for a cysto to use iodine swabs or surgical scrub? And Susie oh, yeah. said they use HibaCleanse. Now I can tell you, Susie, that recently we would use HibaCleanse as well, but HibaCleanse is actually not recommended in vaginal mucosa. So we actually switched to betadine again. Um, and so, so what, because that was something that we used all the time until I don't mm -hmm. know how it got brought up, but we found out that it's actually not good for mucosa. Hmm. Good point. And I didn't, I didn't ask a question on the, uh, that part of the prep, but that's uh, another area to think about. All right. So because we're running short on time, I want to make sure I finish up a few things here. So autoclaves, we mentioned sterilizing. I just wanted to make sure that you're aware that sterilizers, if you have an autoclave in your office, make sure you know how to use it. It needs time, it needs pressure, and it needs uh, temperature. And it has to reach all those things in order to cause sterilization. So you should have a way to monitor that. 
you also have to be careful because super pressurized heated steam is is super hot and that stuff is you know you can get a serious burn if you try to take something out of a open uh freshly opened autoclave too soon and there are monitors i have the side x strip there for some reason but just to kind of show there are monitors for whether your sterilizer is working properly either. So even the fact that you're sterilizing something doesn't necessarily mean that it's sterile if you're not getting pressure, time, and temperature. So there's strips that can tell you whether it's reached the proper temperature. There are strips that can tell you that it's reached the proper pressure. And you can do something that's called a spore test, which is that thing on the 3M head over there, which shows whether it's killing spores or not, which would show you that it's reached all three things. The point I like to make here is Whatever you're doing in your office, and we all have different practices, but I think that the big point I like to make is document. Make sure you're putting down what you're doing and keeping track of it. Soak times. How long are you soaking things for? If you're testing with Sidex strips, put down your results of your test strips. If you're running an autoclave, have results of your autoclave. Um, you need this, this stuff to, to know that things are deep being done properly. And I think one of the points that uh, John had brought out, he said, you know, I've got somebody who trains them and I've got somebody who supervises them. That's important. You need to have both. And as Lori had mentioned too, without the supervision, you know, great employees will still be great employees, but they, people are people, you know, they're going to slip up on stuff. If you don't have somebody who's kind of looking over their shoulder and making sure it's being done, documentation is a great way that that can occur. And I'll, uh, I'll share a story and anybody who's got comments and stories, this is the end of the talk. So feel free to put those in the comments as I tell my story for documentation. We had a, a case, we do not near as many vasectomies, I think as John does, but we do a fair number of vasectomies in the office. Vasectomy, sterile equipment, we use an autoclave to sterilize it. Well, a patient came back with a wound infection. Now, John could probably comment to this. Wound infection after vasectomy is not a small, it's not a large number, but it's not a small number either. Patients will get, you know, the, where the scrotum's at, it's possible to get an infection there. This patient had just a, a skin infection, comes back and the wife said, she's with the guy, says, are you sure your equipment is sterile? And, you know, that was her question to us. So I'm like, well, I can tell you that everything is either disposable or run through our autoclave. And I had my documentation board that I went out and got and said, and here's how we certify that our autoclave is working. I said, see this test here that goes out? This proves that it kills even spores. I said, so I can, yes, I can tell you that your husband's equipment was sterile. It's as sterile as the hospital could do. Well, he, good news is it, it, patients wound healed with normal antibiotics. Everything was fine, but it was kind of nice having that documentation to rely on to kind of put somebody's mind at ease and probably, you know, prevent any risk of them going to a lawyer, not any risk, I should say, but you know, the risk it's, it's good, good practice is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. All right. And and it, anybody uh, can sue anybody. The other thing is when exactly. it comes to autoclaves, make sure you are sending it or putting it through the preventive maintenance, the PMs on yes. a regular basis. And whenever the PM company comes out, you're paying them. So that's another form of documentation. And you, they yep. usually put a sticker on the machine itself, reminding you when the next PM is due. Yeah, yeah, good point. All right, Lori, any final thoughts? Anything from our-, uh, our... We just have some, uh, let's see, I go back here. So- Infection um, risk after a vasectomy should be less than 1%. Yeah. So a lot of people are using the HIPAA cleanse and now she'll use, they use HIPAA cleanse, they work in the OR. What what's in hip HIPAA cleanse? I'm not. We use BZK, benzocholium chloride. Um, I'm trying to think of the other word for the HIPAA cleanse. Oh, so that's chlor chlorhexidine. Chlor that yes, chlorhexidine. Yeah. Yep. Okay. yep. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we use the BZK wipes just because they're not as messy. You know, staining people's underwear when they leave. We will the use that if they're allergic to the betadine. Yeah. But we still use beta dine first. All right. Well, in the comments, if you guys want to say how much you liked or didn't like this format, let me know. I think we've done this now for a couple of weeks and uh, I, I enjoy it. I kind of, it's fun to, to be able to go back and forth on people's thoughts and 
we got experts. I may as well utilize their expertise. Well, I think, Vic, this is kind of like, you know how when you go to scientific meetings and then the presenter goes on stage and talks about stuff, and then you get the most value from the discussions that ensue outside of the actual presentation. Yeah, absolutely. This is, this is exactly what we're doing. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, great. I appreciate you guys all joining me, you, you, Laurie and John. Couldn't do this without you. Wouldn't be as much fun, that's for sure. And uh, I think this was a lot of information. It's the, the most comments I've ever seen come through on the comment box. I know, so, I'm trying hey, to keep up. <laughs> audience, you're doing a great job. Um, I do have a couple promos I'm going to put out there. So here's my first promo for Bootcamp. Rally for Bootcamp, our monthly meeting where we decode the art of video streaming. Enlist for tactical sessions on cutting edge techniques, intel on industry shifts, and a chance to appear live on my streaming program. Gear up, stay sharp, and gain the upper hand in the streaming battlefield. No experience necessary. All are welcome. There is a limit of only 10 live participants, the first 10 to register, and 200 spots additional available for watching. Questions can be submitted via the comment box. This event will not be streamed on any social media platforms, so no worries about appearing live online. And it all starts September the 4th at 7 p.m. Central Time. Be there to join us on Boot Camp. All right. Hope some, some more folks will join us for that. Um, you go to Euronurse.com and you'll be able to sign up for Boot Camp. Uh, this first episode, I've already got the format set up, uh, working on my slides on it. It's going to be on microphones. What's the best choice of microphones for doing podcasting? Because it does make a huge difference what you use and how you sound. We're all using different microphones and we all sound great on this show. Um, but that's what boot camp's going to be about. If people that are interested in getting into this format, doing podcasting, we're going to discuss all sorts of things. You don't have to be in healthcare. You could just be interested so we'll see who all signs up for it. I started the advertisement and I've already got a few people signed up. So be sure to join us. Um, I did look at the con comments as I was going through the, the play and you guys seem to really like that format. So I think we'll be doing more of this in the future because this, uh, like I said, for me, this is a blast. And as John said, it's just like, you know, when you go to a talk, you learn more from the conversation around the talk sometimes than you do the talk itself. Now we're getting it. Today's the last day of August, which means we're going into September. So I decided I'm going to do something on Euronurse just for that. September is Prostate Cancer Awareness Month, a crucial time to focus on raising awareness about the importance of early detection and treatment. This month, Euronurse is dedicating its entire educational program to prostate cancer, offering valuable resources, information sessions, and expert talks to help healthcare providers stay informed. Join us next Saturday to kick off prostate cancer awareness. All right. So I'm going to kick it off next week with a show devoted. The whole month's going to be devoted to prostate cancer. So I want to go ahead and get you guys out there to start thinking about what you're doing for prostate cancer awareness month. Put those in the comments. You can use the ask your own nurse to send me information about what you're doing. And we're going to start kicking it off with what things go on and what kind of awareness there is out there. So. September is going to be prostate cancer awareness for your owners. All right. Hope you guys have a great holiday weekend. Enjoy your days, your extra day off. No work Monday, right? All right. Well, when you run Thanks, your, own practice, when you run your own practice, there's no really off day. We'll all feel <laughs> bad for you on Monday, John. <laughs> yeah. I'm enjoying my weekend. So <laughs> have a chicken. And for me, most me. days are a holiday, so I don't really <laughs> mind either. I don't notice the difference. I'll be off, but uh, I love it. I, I, I got the whole week off next week, so that's that's a, a bonus for me. All right. Well, thanks everybody for joining us. Join us next week. We're going to kick off that prostate cancer awareness month here on your owner. See all everybody next week. Bye, Bye everyone.